speaking with Professor Michael Bishop of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center and 1989 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine. Thanks for joining me today, Michael. Glad to be here. These chats are part of our textbook. And your chapter is Transformation and Oncogenesis. And what I'd like to do is start off by hearing from you a little bit about where you were brought up and, and educated and trained. Well, I was uh, born and raised in, a, in a rural Pennsylvania, uh, near, near York, a uh, town of 400 uh, on the Susquehanna River. Uh, it was a fairly woebegotten place at the time, and as I learned just a few years ago when, when I backed for the first time, it still is. <laughs> uh, my father was a, a Lutheran minister with two very small parishes about 35 miles apart, and one was in this town. Uh, <clears throat> my first education was in a two-room schoolhouse. They had eight grades in a two-room schoolhouse, two blocks from where I lived. Uh, there, and there were two teachers. Uh, one teacher had the first four grades and another teacher had the second four grades. And as you might imagine, this required a level of discipline uh, <laughs> that would be probably unacceptable to, in our public schools today. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I was a, a hyperactive uh, kid and also uh, bright and uh, very curious. So first grade was proving to be pretty easy mm -hmm. to the point where when I was supposed to be in the back of the room and quiet while the second grade was up front reciting <laughs> as they said I was putting out my hand and answering the questions that were being asked <laughs> in the second grade. The teacher got tired of this disruptive behavior, consulted my parents and had me skip mm -hmm. the next grade and uh, so I finished the first four years in three uh, I made up for that in medical schools so here later probably. Uh, so, uh, and then the second four years, uh, I have very little recollection of that teacher other than that it was, it was a woman who was kind and um, pleasant. But the next four years uh, in another room um, were taught by uh, a remarkable man who made an indelible impression on me. He was a rough-hewn character, a uh, deer hunter. Uh, he had in his contract he had uh, the first day of deer season off which means we had off and if he didn't get a deer the first day he got another day off so we cheered for the deer um, but he was um, uh, a rustic intellectual and uh, his passion for uh, teaching and knowledge just they grabbed me mm -hmm. I don't think most of the other students uh, in the room were prepared for that. I was by virtue of my background. Uh, uh, my father being a Lutheran minister, there was at least some sophisticated uh, uh, literature in the house. Uh, and, and my mother, who was um, a valedictorian of her high school class, but could mm -hmm. not go on to higher education because she also inherited the family. Everyone else, uh, her mother and father had died, and she was the eldest, so at the, after um, she graduated from high school, she was in charge of the, of the household. Uh, so there was an, a, an air of intellectual aspiration in my home, which was not in most of any of the other homes in the community. So I, I responded to this man. Um, um, and what he taught in particular with passion was history. And I've loved history ever since. It's been a hobby of mine, reading it, thinking about it, teaching it even when I teach uh, science. Uh, but there was no science taught, mm -hmm. zero, from grade o, zero to eight, one to eight. Um, <clears throat> then I went to a small high school, about 80 in my class, about four of us went to college eventually. And there I was taught science, but in a very ordinary, uh, almost rote manner. But still I, had a, I, took, I just had a native liking for it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I guess I, I just found myself intrigued about uh, understanding how things work, uh, how the world around us worked. Um, uh, <clears throat> and, and the teachers, although they were not uh, particularly uh, great, uh, they were very supportive of me. I stood out again uh, uh, f because of my uh, enthusiasm for 
classwork, which mm -hmm. was not shared by very many of my classmates, most of whom went straight from high school to the steel mills nearby. Um, and they made me feel uh, acceptable, and gradually my fellow classmates made me feel accepted, to the point that I decided that I needed not only to excel scholastically, but I needed to, I needed to mix in with the athletic culture of the place, which was dominant. So uh, <clears throat> I went out for football. <laughs> I weighed about 90 pounds, and I was about five feet five at that point. And the coach, who um, also became an, an endearing figure to me eventually, um, asked him, Mike, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, I want to be quarterback. Uh, why? Well, I'm smart. I learn all the plays. There were about eight. Um, he said, you, you just can't do this. Oh, yeah, I, I, I want to come out. Um, by the time I got home, the coach had sent a note to my mother and father. It said, keep Mike home or he'll get killed. <laughs> so I became the, the statistician for the team. I, I uh, recorded every play uh, and the errors that were made on the play, what guard didn't pull when he was supposed mm -hmm. to pull and so forth. And then I had a moment of glory every Monday when we would meet in the chemistry teaching lab and I would review all of the plays and who didn't do what they were supposed to do. And my word was law and the coach took it as law. So <laughs> that was great fun. Uh, eventually I, I, I made the track team. I was woeful at basketball. I made a, had a go at that. I had loved baseball so I, I, mm -hmm. I had a go at that and it was terrible. But I made the track team. It took me four years, but I got my letter. I still have it. Uh, and this uh, coach, who also taught us physics, incidentally, in a fairly engaging manner, uh, <coughs> came up to me at um, my graduation uh, and congratulated me on being valedictorian. And I said, I want to thank you for that letter I have. That really means a lot to me. And he looked at me and said, I'd rather be thanked for the course in physics I taught you. <laughs> uh, 20 years or more later, uh, after I had received the Nobel Prize, uh, I gave a lecture at the Penn State Medical School in Hershey mm -hmm. that was widely advertised. And when it was over, I saw this gray-haired figure get up from the front row and come up to say hello to me and realized it was that coach. Mm -hmm. He lived about 75 miles away. He was a motorcycle fanatic. He used to do stunts on motorcycles while we were running our exercises at the track, uh, at, at track practice. He had ridden his motorcycle all the way to hear me talk. He mm. wanted to find out wow. what I'd done. And so we had a wonderful 10-minute uh, chat, and it, it was really touching. I mean, he obviously really cared uh, that... Uh, that I should succeed uh, and was so immensely pleased uh, uh, that I had been a student of his and what, what I had uh, accomplished. It was, it was a stunning moment, uh, which obviously I've never forgotten. It was quite a while ago now. Um, so I, um, that, that was high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, <coughs> I even... I even succeeded uh, with romance. <laughs> I had my first girlfriend, um, uh, who eventually we parted ways when we went to different colleges. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, I had to choose a college. Only there was no choice. I was going to go to Gettysburg College hmm. because that's where my father had gone. It was at the time associated with the Lutheran Church. Uh, my parents, it was about 50 miles away, so it was enough separation for me, but my parents could still feel that they could drop by when they had to, and incidentally, pick up the laundry and do it for me every <laughs> month or so. So I went to Gettysburg College, a small liberal arts college, which mm -hmm. these days has achieved some uh, prominence, but in those days was rather ordinary, except it had some wonderful faculty. Um, <clears throat> And what happened to me there was that not only was my interest in science fostered, particularly by a physics teacher who was a mesmerizing teacher mm -hmm. and actually had um, a 
very promising career as a theoretician aborted by being drafted into the U.S. Army in the Second World War and coming back with what we would now call post-traumatic stress syndrome mm -hmm. and not being able to continue as a theoretician and instead opting for a life as a teacher in a small college. And um, he, he was an absolutely mesmerizing teacher and uh, took me under his wing, uh, uh, knowing that I had some academic aspirations uh, beyond college. But the other wonderful thing that happened to me there is that uh, I fell in love with the liberal arts. I, my home was, uh, w um, th there was uh, th theological literature in it mm -hmm. and books, uh, but the best reading available was probably Reader's Digest. Uh, so in college I discovered books, mm -hmm. real books, good books. I discovered uh, I, I returned to my love of history, took several uh, major advanced courses in history, uh, and took the bare minimum of chemistry courses, four, to be a chemistry major as a pre-med. I would have to have taken more if I had any aspirations mm -hmm. to go on uh, to get a PhD. Uh, now, I had entered college with rather vague uh, career ideas, um, but I identified myself as a pre-med hmm. because um, of a family physician who had also taken me under his wing when I was in, still in high school to the point of taking me on uh, house calls with him, uh, taking me into the operating room of the Carlisle, Pennsylvania Hospital, a small you know, community hospital and watching a, a hip operation actually scrubbing in and watching him. I was, a, I think, a sophomore in high school at the time. And um, uh, so I, it was really the force of his personality and the force of his commitment to the career that uh, uh, prompted me to, to um, think about it as mm -hmm. a career and, and to identify as a pre-med in college. Uh, all I knew about what PhDs in chemistry did, for example, was they went and worked for DuPont, and that was the farthest thing from my mind. <laughs> uh, and I had sort of dimly perceived that um, medical education is relatively broad and might mm -hmm. prov provide me with a relatively broad platform from which to go on and do something I did not know quite what. Uh, there was no research at Gettysburg College at mm -hmm. the time. There is now. There's even NSF-supported research there. I visited a number of times. Um, so I had no clue about what mm -hmm. research might be. I, I had no clue about how that information that so engaged me in textbooks had been mm -hmm. acquired. Uh, <clears throat> but I love college. It was, it was I, I, I have said to the dismay of many people, my wife included, although I must say I met her there, so I don't know why she takes such offense, <laughs> that I have never been happier before or since than I was in college because I, it was, I was like a kid in a candy mm. shop, mm. suddenly unleashed. Um, so the time came for me to apply to medical school. The other member of the faculty who would be particularly taking me under his wing was my teacher in uh, uh, quantitative chemistry. Uh, another man who was particularly engaging and although very low prof very low key, uh, inspiring in his own way, and cared immensely for students and was really my principal mentor. And he and the physics teacher are people I went back to visit uh, uh, in Gettysburg whenever I had a chance uh, until the days they died. Um, so he called me in his office one day and said, Mike, um, have you thought about we are going to apply to medical school? And I said, well, no, not really. He said, well, um, you know, our best students usually go to Penn. Mm -hmm. It wasn't far away. They had sort of a track to Penn. Uh, but what do you want to do? And I said, I, I don't really know, except that I like what I see about the academic life. I wasn't yet aware of salary scales at small liberal arts colleges. And uh, so I want to be an academician. I, I think that's what I want to be. Mm -hmm. I had no clue what that meant, OK? Uh, other than somehow identified with teaching at the time. Mm. And he said, well, then you should also apply to Harvard. Mm. 
And I said, where's that? I had never <laughs> heard of the place. And he said, in Boston, somewhere, I think. <laughs> I think his uncertainty was whether it might be over in Cambridge, mm -hmm. you know, but right. Uh, right. in any event. So I, and when I tell my current medical students this, they think I'm fabricating it. I applied to three medical schools, mm -hmm. Penn, Harvard, and Hopkins, uh, on, the, on his advice. <clears throat> and um, in due course, I was accepted to all three. I, um, I was interviewed at Penn twice, once for Penn and once for Harvard by a Harvard alumnus. I mm -hmm. didn't have the money to travel to Boston, so I didn't travel to Boston for an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, and after interviewing at Hopkins and seeing what the neighborhood was like, it was unlike anything I had ever laid eyes on, of course, I withdrew my <laughs> I withdrew <laughs> there wow. and let us stand with Penn and Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, the, um, uh, so I, I had a conundrum at that point. I hadn't even seen Harvard. And um, so I wrote to Harvard and said, I haven't visited there. I, it's very, I'm very pleased you admitted me, but I'm having trouble deciding between Penn and Harvard. Could I please come and visit Harvard and check it out? Oh, of course. Come on up. We'll pay your way and so forth. So I went up and I had a spectacular uh, four or five days. You know, I, was t I was taken into open heart surgery. And I had my finger in a human mitral valve. I was taken to the Harvard-Yale game. I was shown what tweed jackets are. I mean, it was the full Monte. <laughs> and you know, I came home, my head spinning. And meanwhile, I had them to go back to Penn. For, they wanted me to come down and be interviewed for a scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I did. And the man who interviewed me was the dean of students. He said to me, the opening question was, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I have this sort of vague interest in being an academic. This was been in 1952 uh, or three. Um, oh, he said, where have you been admitted? I said, here in Harvard. And he said, you should go to Harvard. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I went to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a culture shock, to say the least. I'd never been around so many smart people. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them smarter than I am. I thought, at least, it seemed that way. Uh, many of them with very sophisticated backgrounds. Many of them, some of them with serious research uh, yeah. backgrounds. Um, and the first year was a tough slug because mm -hmm. uh, I had no way of knowing how I was measuring up because Harvard had this interesting system at the time, which I actually endorse. They would not, they graded you, but they would not tell you your grades. Mm -hmm. And unless the dean called you in, you were doing okay. And you were on your own to do as well as you wanted to or thought. You got graded uh, mm -hmm. exams back, corrected yeah. exams back, no grade. And uh, I thought that was great. And, and through my years of curricular development and evaluation and as an academician, I've always thought back on that and thought, that really is the best way. Uh, it's better than no grades at all, I think. Uh, um, because there is on record, uh, uh, these things are on record to be used by higher authorities. For example, mm -hmm. in our case, it would be internship and residency. Uh, but at the pre-med level uh, you know, for admission and to example, for example, Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz started out with, as an idyllic place with no grades and anyone who was applying for advanced education, be it PhD or MD or whatever, was evaluated by lengthy essays. And that was it. And I was on admissions committee where those essays were used, mm. and I felt that those students were getting the short shrift. Uh, because the reaction to these essays was very qualitative. It was all over the map among the committee. There was just nothing quantitative to hang your hat on. But I I in any event, um, uh, <clears throat> I was now at Harvard Medical School. And the first thing, now I had grown up with pretty good music, uh, which was another love of mine. Uh, my father um, w was a, uh, uh, not a, a um, strict <laughs> constructionist uh, theologian. He was 
uh, a very, um, he was a liberal and uh, a man with rather sophisticated tastes in music. And so I heard a lot of Bach in, mm -hmm. in uh, my uh, church experiences and fell in love with it. Uh, <clears throat> I studied the piano and uh, for probably 10 years and began to play the pipe organ, which uh, that was, became my true love and reached, became sufficiently proficient so I could play for his services. So he had free, he had a free organist. Uh, I had to give it up when I went to college. It just wasn't practical. I couldn't get practice time on the college organ. The music majors dominated it. In any event, I gave it up. It was impractical. But I, uh, by the time I got to Boston, I, I was deeply in love with classical music, but had heard very little of it live. And we may, may have had Mario Lanza, uh, uh, singing uh, operatic arias at home on records, but that was about it. It was only the liturgical music that mm -hmm. I knew. And the first weekend that I was in medical school, a newfound friend said, I got two tickets to the Boston Symphony. You want to come? I said, oh yeah. And I'll never forget, the first thing they played was a Bach orchestral suite, and I was crying, literally crying. I just was so happy. And, um, I realized I'd come to the right place. Mm. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with the Philadelphia Orchestra, <laughs> but in any event, um, there were people who wanted to do this sort of thing. Mm. That was the point, a lot of them. Which leads me to a very important point, and that is that uh, I, was, I still had no vocation, really. Mm -hmm. But what I was encountering uh, were first faculty who were repeatedly making reference to research mm -hmm. and using research examples in their lectures. Mm -hmm. Not always well, not always. Actually, the teaching at Harvard at the time, with a few exceptions, was not all that good. Um, but uh, they were talking about research. And uh, some of the people I immediately befriended, classmates uh, at Harvard, who remain friends to this day, were people who had sophisticated, I just gravitated to them somehow, sophisticated research experience. And it was their example, more than anything else, that convinced me that I ought to start thinking about that mm -hmm. as a career. Uh, and uh, I have to say to this day, and I tell my students this regularly when uh, the opportunity arises, that I think I learned more about myself that I wanted to do, and even how to do it from my classmates than I learned from my faculty. Mm -hmm. And I think that they would probably, they will probably find that's true too if they choose their, mm -hmm. their friends well. Um, uh, in any event, so I had this vague interest. I had no idea how to proceed with it. Um, uh, now much was made by Harvard at the time uh, of uh, having students spend the summer between say their first and second year and their second and third year even, in Boston, mm -hmm. at their own expense, uh, working in a lab. And my first year curriculum, uh, the only course that really engaged me uh, was neuroanatomy, and secondarily, uh, neurobiology, mm -hmm. uh, which in those days was mostly putting micropipettes into the spinal cord, and so it, was, uh, it, was that, it was at that thing. But I was just absolutely entranced by the nervous system uh, I absolutely aced the neuroanatomy course because I just I thought it was fantastic to be tracing these tracks in the brain that lets us do what we do. I just thought that was spectacular. Um, and the teacher was an uh, absolutely uh, spectacular teacher. Uh, in fact, I, I have found traveling around medical schools that neuroscience, neuroanatomy seems to be exceptionally well taught in many places. It seems to be it is at UCSF one of the most popular courses uh, because of the quality of the teaching. In, in any event, I got interested in neuroscience. So at the, uh, Harvard had not yet reached its soon-to-be-achieved eminence in neuroscience. There was really only one person who taught most of the, the neurophysiology part. And I went to him and asked about working in his lab, and he, you know, he listened to my background and said, well, maybe you could hang out here this summer. It was obvious he wasn't interested in having a raw recruit like me around. So instead I went off and did what I had done for several summers during college. I went to Yellowstone Park, pumped gas, hiked, and fished. 
uh, <clears throat> but the, the you know the uh, the 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 there was now a bee in my bonnet about mm -hmm. what I might want to do. The second year in medical school, I finally encountered molecular biology. In the biochemistry course in 1957-58 at Harvard Medical School, there was no mention of the double helix. Okay? <laughs> wow. We were taught how purines and pyrimidines were made, mm -hmm. which was I found excruciatingly boring, yeah. but there was no measure of the double helix. The microbiology course was engineered by Bernie Davis, mm -hmm. the man who discovered mm -hmm. the mechanism of action of penicillin. And he and Boris Magasanik and a few other members of the course, they taught a course that was talking about this emerging field of molecular biology because, of course, at the time, molecular biology was all about microbes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Phage and bacteria, mm -hmm. right. primarily. And I went trotting off to the library and started reading, and the first thing I found was an article in Scientific American about the double helix. Oh, woo, this is great stuff, you know? <laughs> uh, so I started snooping around the micro department for somebody to do some research with, and um, the, 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 I kept getting directed to a man named Luigi Gorini, mm -hmm. whose uh, broken English I simply could not understand, and whose papers on bacterial genetics were absolutely beyond me at the time. So that discouraged me, and uh, I was rescued by uh, a man, a uh, professor of pathology, uh, Ed Taft, who was teaching in our um, uh, pathology mm -hmm. microscopy sections, the labs. And, during, and he was a, a, a garrulous and caring individual, and during the course of the year, he picked up on my frustrated inclinations, and he said, you know, we have a fellowship at the Mass General Hospital Pathology Department. Uh, it's called the Post-Sophomore Fellowship. It's an NIH stipend. Um, and you come and you learn to do pathology, and you work in a research lab, and you could work in my research lab, and why don't you do that? Um, so I consulted with my girlfriend, then fiance, who I'd met in college. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought, well, sure, we'll get married at the end of the second year, and then I'll have a th whole year where I'm my own boss. Uh, I knew the pathologists were nine to fivers. And uh, <laughs> I'll have some spare time. And she could start teaching in Boston. She incidentally wound up teaching in Roxbury at a time when that was almost like teaching in a penal institution. Mm -hmm. uh, for a year or so, and then moved to Newton Center to teach. But in any event, um, I agreed to do this. And it was a spectacular year because I was my own boss. Uh, first of all, I learned a huge amount from the pathology. Uh, within a month, I was doing postmortems on my own. I did 50 mm -hmm. some that year. Uh, I would write them up, and then we would, uh, as with any resident, uh, I was treated like a resident, literally. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and um, I responded. So I, I learned a huge amount from doing postmortem and surgical pathology. And I worked in Ed Taft's lab on a very, very mundane project. But I befriended Malin Hoagland mm -hmm. of S, what we then called sRNA, which turned out to be tRNA. Crick was just then talking about uh, the, there must be such a thing, mm -hmm. you know. Right. But, his colleagues at the Mass General had discovered this and were running translation in vitro, and I thought that was near paradise, that yeah. sort of research. Uh, so I, I leaned heavily on Malin for sort of uh, moral support, and uh, um, uh, so it was, and, and I did a huge amount of personal instruction. Mm -hmm. there, there was a spectacular medical bookstore about five blocks from our little apartment that Catherine and I uh, rented for something like $90 a month. We got a $15 discount because I took the garbage out every, every uh, <laughs> Monday morning. Uh, it was a, it was a two-room basement apartment uh, at the time of the Boston Strangler. We lived in it for uh, five years. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I was able, I would go to that, that we were on a, living on a shoestring. We had her, mm -hmm. we had my stipend and her modest teaching salary. And I would go to this bookstore and just go down the shelf looking for things about nucleic acids, RNA, uh, microbial genetics, and it, by the time I'd finished, I had accumulated a library of probably 50 books. I still have them. Uh, and I'd read all of them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand all of them, but I knew that that's where I wanted to land. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, <clears throat> uh, by the end of that year, uh, I was determined to find a research opportunity a little more sophisticated than mm -hmm. what I'd had in the pathology department. And since I, I, I had learned everything I needed to know in the third year of medical school from mm -hmm. the pathology, uh, other than how to do a physical examination. So the third year was a breeze, and I had some spare time. I took an elective course. Um, I had, of course, realized that the molecular biology at the moment, at that moment, was being done with bacteria and phage, mm -hmm. primarily. Right. And that it had become very hot, and that the people in it were very smart, and uh, I was going to have trouble breaking in. Uh, but during my microbiology course in my second year, I had been drawn to animal viruses. First of all, they were fascinating biologically, and of course they, they were major pathogens, the ones we were studying. And so I took an elective course during my third year. Um, on a, in animal viruses, uh, and one of the instructors was a instructor at the time, a Harvard instructor who had just come back from his Rhodes Scholarship, and uh, <clears throat> named Elmer Pfefferkorn. Mm -hmm. And Elmer had a one-room lab with an office, and he had a technician at the time who he eventually had to let go because he didn't have enough money. And I joined it. I was it. Mm -hmm. uh, and after the technician left, I washed the dishes mm -hmm. as my rent, right? <laughs> uh, and Elmer put me on to, uh, a, a, suggested a project to me that I found really intriguing uh, because I had learned about how important mutants had been in mm -hmm. the, uh, the founding of molecular biology mm -hmm. and so forth. And nothing like this was being done with animal viruses at the time. Absolutely nothing. And Elmer suggested that we try to isolate temperature-sensitive mutants of Simbus virus, which was the virus he was working with. Uh, we knew nothing about the genome of the virus, you know, nothing about the structure at that point. Um, so I set about to isolate temperature-sensitive mm -hmm. mutants. And we had a lovely plaque assay that was done in monolayers of chick embryo fibroblasts that were grown in these little milk bottles that you could buy dirt cheap and reuse over mm -hmm. and over and over mm -hmm. again. Just <laughs> wash them out and reuse them. And about one month into it, it stopped working. The, mm. the plaque assay absolutely stopped working and never started again while I was mm. in the lab. And um, uh, it's in, in due course, after I left Elmer's lab, um, Boyce, um, uh, 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 another a, a, a PhD student came along with mm -hmm. Elmer. The assay started working again, and um, Elmer got his TS mutants. Uh, he eventually uh, went off and started and, and finished his career as chair of microbiology at Dartmouth, mm -hmm. as studying a protozoa. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, uh, not being able to make the plaque assay work, therefore not being able to go looking for mutants, I decided I'd do molecular biology. Now, Elmer had never touched it, had never been done in his mm -hmm. lab, but Malin Hoagland's lab mm -hmm. had moved from Mass General to the same floor where we were. So I went down, and um, uh, Malin wasn't much available. He's pretty busy, but he had this terrific technician whom he eventually married. Um, who helped me. I said, look, uh, I want to try, this is an RNA virus, and the genome is a single strand of RNA, that's mm -hmm. much we know, and I want to see if I can translate this in vitro. And nobody had done that before. About a year later, I think it was about a year later, Jim Darnell, uh, I think, and David 
pub, uh, Baltimore began publishing on, on that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But in any event, uh, I, I don't remember the chronology at all well, but at that point it was, and of course it was, a, we didn't know that the virus was a negative stranded genome, incidentally, of course, right? So, uh, so I decided, I, so I set up the in vitro translation uh, with liver uh, microsomes and, mm. and uh, with, I forget the test mRNA I was using, but it worked like a charm. And I learned to purify the, uh, the virus. I set up the purification based on, I don't remember what protocol in the literature, it wasn't not, not much of that being done at the time with animal viruses. So I was able to purify the virus. Um, among other things, I showed that I could uh, treat it with a non-ionic detergent and get a smaller thing and sedimented differently in a sucrose gradient. I had learned how to do sucrose gradients and set those up mm -hmm. in an Elmer's lab. Um, I was a serious autodidact, not, not always successful, but serious about it and just having a ball, just absolutely having a ball with absolutely no concern that nothing was working. Uh, what was this going to do to my career and so forth? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I put in the Synbus RNA and it didn't work. Uh, along the way, I, I encountered an interesting problem. Uh, I needed S35 methionine to do the mm -hmm. in vitro mm -hmm. translations. Elmer couldn't afford it. He suggested I make it <laughs> because, you know, if we just fed radioactive sulfur, which was dirt mm -hmm. cheap, to bacteria and then purified to methionine, it'd be a piece of cake. Okay, so I did that. <laughs> and you know, I got it down to the point of uh, a white powder mm -hmm. and I dropped it on the floor and lost about half of it. Frantic. I was so angry that I broke about five big graduated cylinders in the sink. I was just furious. Elmer forgave me. <laughs> And uh, I ran the reaction, they didn't work. Um, and um, now, this didn't all happen in the third year. I mean, this took time, right? So the point is that I was having a good time in Elmer's lab, even though the PAC assay was not working. So I decided that's what I wanted to do for my fourth year of medical school. Mm -hmm. To hell with the clinical clerkships, this is what I wanted to do. I went to the dean of students, made that proposal to him. And he looked at me and said, that's professional suicide. I said, well, that's what I want to do. He said, no one's ever done this. I, I'm not sure I can allow this. Um, look, if you will, wh what are you going to do next? I said, well, I, uh, after I graduate, I don't know that I have any choice. I'll probably have to do an internship and a residency mm -hmm. and then try to find my way into research. He said, you take the clerkship in whatever specialty you want to intern in, and that would be internal medicine. And I'll give it the rest of the year off mm -hmm. and do this. So that was the deal. So I did my internship, my clerkship mm -hmm. in internal medicine at the Mass General Hospital, which was and is a spectacular place. I had a, a truly terrific time doing it. Uh, and some of the people I worked with, some of my, the residents that I worked with went on to become esteemed uh, members of the American medical uh, community. Uh, but I was really champing at the bit um, to um, get back to the lab. So having done my two months at, mm -hmm. I think it was two, uh, at the Mass General, I was free to do research the rest of the fourth year. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the Mass General, the uh, Massachusetts had a requirement that in order to uh, be, uh, graduate and be licensed mm -hmm. to, be, to do your internship, you had to participate in uh, a birth. <clears throat> and for most Harvard students, that was meant standing around behind 10 people watching at the, uh, the Boston Lying In Hospital. I went to the Boston City Hospital and personally cut the cord on about four <laughs> deliveries over one weekend, so I passed. I also spent some time hanging out at the Beth Israel Hospital, which at the time was at a, uh, in one of its uh, uh, nadirs. Um, and which students were avoiding like the plague. And I was so welcome there that I was treated like a, a resident. I did an appendectomy myself with the chief resident, you know, overseeing it. And uh, also, incidentally, was at the bedside when Grace, uh, the, the woman who wrote Peyton Place, died of her esophageal varices. It was quite an experience. This, I was doing all this in my spare time, mostly on the weekends, while doing work in Elmer's lab. So 
um, I came out of that experience just absolutely convinced. I mean, abs nothing had worked, but absolutely convinced I wanted to be a scientist, a medical scientist. And, um, but I had to, uh, I had no prospect yet. I mean, mm -hmm. with my background, no one was going to take me straight in, particularly in those days when no one was worried about physician scientists yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Um, so I had signed on uh, for an internship in residency, residency, and um, it turned out that I hadn't committed professional suicide. This was at Harvard as well, the internship residency? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Mass General, Mass right? General. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, and I like to tell my medical students this when they get a little over amped about mm -hmm. the you know competition, I, and, and I like to dramatize it with the story of my interview for the internship. I went, we had to be interviewed, right? I applied. Uh, uh, what what Harvard did in those days, having not given you any grades, mm -hmm. um, the man who advised every student in the class, uh, the esteemed retired gastroenterologist, called each student in and gave them a list of where they ought to consider interning. And the list reflected which third of the class you were in. At that point, you mm -hmm. knew which third of the class you were in. And I, the Mass General and the Brigham and so forth were on my list. I did traipse up to Rochester and out to Minneapolis mm -hmm. to, to go through the motions, but I desperately wanted to stay in Boston because I just, my wife and I loved the city. She had a job there. Uh, and I, I had no idea, I, so I applied to all the three Harvard hospitals at the time, they still had the Boston City, and I would have been very happy at the Boston City because I had a superb experience there as a third year medical student. Again, they were glad to have students. I mean, we had a lot more responsibility students mm -hmm. than, say, a student at the Mass General or the Brigham. Yeah. Uh, in any event, uh, I went for my interview uh, at Mass General, and the Department of Medicine at the time was chaired by an uh, esteemed R rheumatologist, Walter Bauer, mm -hmm. uh, who really was no great shakes uh, as a, uh, an investigator, but who had huge respect uh, for medical science and felt that science should be a powerful presence in clinical departments and literally single-handedly turned the Department of Medicine uh, at the Mass General into a research uh, powerhouse. Uh, so I go in and here are all the division chiefs sitting around the table, some of whom I knew and were, uh, found intimidating, and Bauer, who was a curmudgeon, if there ever w one was born, at the end of the table, the opposite, looking at me. And his opening question was, what did you do uh, during your fourth year? You know, what electives did you take? I said, uh, well, I had my clerkship here. Yeah, I know that. And then I did research. The whole rest of the year? Yes, sir. God damn, how did you ever pull that off? <laughs> and I thought, I'm in. <laughs> and I was. Uh, so I, I uh, did two years there. And it was you know, it left a permanent mark on me. Um, it, uh, it was an extraordinary experience uh, in many ways. Um, you saw a side of life that people of my background don't normally see coming in from the South End and so forth. Uh, um, it was, it, those were other times when we had this charity ward. It was 40 beds arrayed around a mm. mammoth room with just a curtain between each bed. Um, uh, <clears throat> And um, uh, suffice it to say that I don't regret that two-year interregnum uh, in, in medical training. It, uh, it uh, left uh, a desire in me to do something that would ultimately have an impact on, on medicine. Uh, and it certainly taught me how to work with other people. I mean, uh, how to work with the surgeons, how to work with anybody in an acute uh, emergency mm -hmm. when when there's a life on the line, uh, uh, so I, I'm forever grateful for that opportunity. And uh, uh, <clears throat> but I wanted to do science, so uh, my only hope was to get into what was called the research associate program, the NIH, which was designed to take raw material like me with an MD, a mere MD, and uh, uh, turn them mm -hmm. into research. Uh, into scientists. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> and fortunately, I was uh, ad uh, admitted to that. I had to go through interviews, and I had applied to some lab. You, you get the you you made some you put down who who might you want to work with. Mm -hmm. So I put down Marshall Nirenberg. That was an absurdly overambitious uh, uh, choice uh, at the time, uh, and I put down. Uh, Leon Leventhal because I had met him and he was working on animal, but he was working on polio. And he and Jim Darnell had worked together and Darnell, I knew about Darnell from my reading. I didn't know about Leon, but I knew about Darnell and I, uh, Leon took me into the lab. And again, I was the only person in the lab other than a technician at the time and, and turned me loose and I started mm -hmm. working uh, on polio. So tell us how you went from that to working on oncogenes. What's the story there? Right, so um, I had put in uh, two years at NIH mm -hmm. working on polio. And again, I uh, wanted to do, uh, Leon had a biological problem in mind for me, but I wanted to do molecular biology. Mm -hmm. I wanted to isolate the replicative form of polio virus and purify the polymerase, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> Having no biochemical background. But I, I went to work, meanwhile, David Baltimore identified uh, replicative form, replicative intermediate at the time that I was doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went ahead and uh, isolated them as well and did some work on the structure of replicative intermediate and got a, a paper out of it. Uh, and um, that again was a, a lot of, there was a lot of uh, self-instruction there. For example, I needed cesium sulfate mm -hmm. uh, uh, to band uh, RNA in, yeah. right? Cesium chloride doesn't cut the mustard with RNA. But it wasn't available for the reagent grade. I had to, mm -hmm. I had to recrystallize it myself. Like right? methionine, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, the methionine, right. And that, that wasn't the end of that. I had to make my own hydroxyapatite when I was an assistant professor because we were using that to separate mm -hmm. double from single-stranded nucleic acids and it wasn't commercial, reagent grade wasn't mm -hmm, commercial. Right. But anyway, uh, kits were unheard of. But this, that's the short yeah. <laughs> point. Um, so, um, I went to Hamburg for a year with Gebhard Koch, who came and worked in Leon's lab as a sabbatical, and we had struck up a collaboration assessing the infectivity of double-stranded RNA, which led me eventually to do a really interesting experiment, which, to this, which was in a way uh, prophetic, although uh, it didn't lead me to do anything. Um, it, the, it led us eventually to ask which, and I did this as my first project as an mm -hmm. assistant professor, which strand of the double-stranded RNA was being expressed? And uh, we did, I did this by making hybrid uh, double-stranded RNA with, mm -hmm. that had a guanidine-resistant allele in one strand and a sensitivity allele in the other. And to my utter astonishment, it was a negative strand that was being expressed from infectious double-stranded RNA. And at the time, we didn't know that cells had things like RNA helicases and their own RNA polymerases and so forth. And so it was an utter mystery but I got a really nice paper out of that. Uh, it, it, so <clears throat> um, I went to Germany, to Hamburg for a year, mm -hmm. and worked in Gebhardt's lab at the uh, Heinrich Petter Institute, uh, where my next notable successor uh, was Rudy Anish, who started his career there. But in any event, uh, nothing worked. The whole year I was there, we couldn't even grow HeLa cells. So I spent my time learning about Romanesque architecture and traveling around. <laughs> Uh, Germany in my uh, very old secondhand Porsche that I had bought. My wife and I and our St. Bernard dog did that. Uh, and during, while I was over there, uh, I uh, actually before I went over there, um, I was, uh, Dan Nathans had me come to Hopkins and look around and offered me a job. He said, think about it while you're over there. And Leon had left me in the lurch at NIH for a year and moved to UCSF in San Francisco. And he said, uh, why don't you come out here mm -hmm. and take a, a faculty appointment? And I was also interviewed at Harvard by Bernie Davis, but never got far enough along with that uh, before I made the decision to go to San Francisco, mm -hmm. which I made while I was in, in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. So I went to San Francisco expecting to work on polio, and I set up the lab to do it, did the experiment on uh, <clears throat> which strand of the double-stranded RNA is... Uh, uh, expressed. Uh, I did an experiment that 
uh, finished an experiment that I also really liked. I had become enamored of uh, 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 repair, mm -hmm. uh, DNA, D nucleic acid repair, and I was inspired by uh, Robert Zinsheimer, Bob Zinsheimer's work on Q-beta, uh, uh, sorry, on, on single-stranded uh, phage mm -hmm. and uh, single-stranded DNA phage. And um, uh, phi X, in other X, words, yep. right. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> so I did a UV killing curve uh, mm -hmm. of double-stranded RNA and discovered that it could be photoreactivated. And I, to this day, I don't know how that works. Mm -hmm. And that was my first single author paper in the Journal of Molecular Biology, which in those days was the place to publish. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, uh, I, that, so during my first year at UCSF, uh, I turned down Hopkins, uh, and I dropped out at Harvard because I felt that uh, both places were already uh, high-powered communities, and I was a little uneasy about how my style, because uh, I was still learning on the job, would fit in, whereas I knew at UCSF, which at the time was just no great, no shakes one at all whatsoever, and with Leon there as a paterfamilias, that I, my style might work. So I, I took, and then I came out to San Francisco and saw what the city was like, called Catherine and said, pack. <laughs> so I, I wound up at UCSF. And during my first year, um, Leon suggested that I get to know Warren Levinson, who was working right next door to me. He had just been hired, and he had learned the biology of Rouse sarcoma virus working with Harry Rubin. But he was not at all biochemically or molecularly oriented, so it seemed like a reasonable match. And we began to talk, and then to, uh, uh, the original purpose was to figure out how this virus replicated. Nobody knew anything about it. The only person who thought they knew anything about it was Howard Temin, of course, who by that time was beginning to publish uh, experiments that suggested to him at least, but virtually to no one else mm -hmm. at the time, <laughs> that um, the virus must have a DNA intermediate. We didn't have any tools, uh, to, mm -hmm. to, you know, no way to identify the, the viral nucleic acid inside the cell. Um, we did a few crude experiments with inhibitors that sort of conformed to Howard's idea. Uh, Howard had published stuff like that already. We, we were, but we learned how to make the virus tons of it. I mean, grams mm -hmm. of it. And we uh, we could purify it. We'd get a band in the final gradient that was almost an inch thick. <laughs> and uh, I knew that we were going to need that. But meanwhile, of course, I was uh, getting my hands dirty and working with the infected cells. And you know, I was just stunned by, by watching what would happen. You would infect these cells with the virus. And in 24 hours, they went from being a normal chick fibroblast to a facsimile of a cancer cell. It was just absolutely amazing. And I thought, well, Maybe replication is one thing we want to study, but this, this looks like a great tool uh, to study how mm -hmm. cells become malignant. The rapidity of it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a bioassay. Uh, we could make the virus mm -hmm. in quantity. There was the prospect for doing genetics. Uh, there was no biosafety issue. There's a chicken virus. Mm -hmm. It didn't infect human cells. Uh, it certainly didn't replicate in human cells or murine cells and so forth. Um, so uh, that, that I was hooked, and I gradually phased out my work with polio, converted my grant just by changing the title. Those were other days, uh, to uh, and uh, got some other grants to work on Rouse sarcoma virus, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that's how it all started. Okay, tell us a, about a key experiment in your laboratory. Well, <laughs> that's a slam dunk <laughs> question <laughs> if I ever heard one. Um, I started UCSF in 1968, and in 1970, uh, Harold Varmus uh, showed up. And um, by that point, we knew about reverse transcriptase. Uh, we were making radioactive cDNA and using it as a probe to find viral RNA mm -hmm. uh, and DNA in the cell. Um, and we had a nice assay that I had uh, developed uh, using hydroxyapatite that was much better than membrane filters, hybridizations, which were the tradition, the state of the art at the time. Uh, 
And um, um, uh, Harold's first experiment, first work was to demonstrate that, that this DNA actually integrated into the host chromosome, and he did that. And, um, and, and meanwhile, there had um, Stephen Martin, Peter Vogt, Hidesa Buru, Hannah Fusa had all independently produced various sorts of evidence that Rouse sarcoma virus had a gene, at least one gene and perhaps more, but it turned out to be one, that was solely responsible for transformation, had no role in viral replication, solely responsible for transformation. This was pretty exciting because, uh, first of all, um, it sustained my belief that the, the genetics of this virus were really important to us. And um, secondly, now we all wanted to know how that gene worked. But there was an, uh, and um, we pursued that, uh, resulting eventually, as a, as a sidebar here, in the co-discovery by Art Levinson in our lab and Mark Collette in Ray Erickson's lab that the protein encoded by SARC is a protein kinase, mm -hmm. which was a riveting discovery. What better way to have a pleiotropic effect, the sort of that malignant transformation is, mm -hmm. than having a kinase that can phosphorylate a gazillion uh, proteins in the cell. Uh, in any event, so that was one question, how does the thing work? But the other question was, where did it come from? Uh, if it has no, no role in viral replication, what, you know, why did evolution bother? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the thought was it wasn't, it didn't. And, um, and in fact, um, we, we knew it was so irrelevant that the virus, uh, if you just propagated the virus, now it's repeatedly selecting for transformed cells, it soon dropped the gene mm -hmm. and just went its own merry way. It was totally independent of mm -hmm. the gene. So, um, Harold had had experience with Ira Paston at NIH in his previous postdoctoral fellowship, uh, working with deletion mutants of lambda, as I recall, and making gene-specific probes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, we, we parlayed that into using deletion mutants of Rauscher-Kuma virus that took out the transforming activity provided by Peter Vogt to, into making a radioactive CNA probe that would be for at least part of, we would, had no idea what part of, but at least part of um, the transforming gene, which was dubbed SARC because of the sarcomas the virus elicits. So, now I want to emphasize that we had no recombinant DNA, right, no cloning. We were using huge amounts of virus to make P32 labeled cDNA and then doing hybridization selections to eliminate the replicative part of the genome and leave us mm -hmm. holding the, the cDNA. So uh, Ram Guntaka, uh, uh, postdoctoral fellow in the lab, got the probe up to a relatively primitive state, but he had another project going and uh, was just didn't have the time to press this. So we suggested to Dominic Stalin, who was in the lab as a postdoc and working on a project that well, probably was not uh, uh, going to go anywhere. And we suggested he take this over. When he did, and he did a spectacular job. I mean, we, he got the probe refined to uh, exquisite purity. Specificity was spectacular. Uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, it was really uh, hard, hard work. I mean, because I had to make that probe repeatedly, and it was a, an arduous process. And by uh, 1974, sometime in 1974, um, he had the first result that this probe would react with normal DNA. Now, the, the backdrop here is that, that not only were we motivated by uh, the evolutionary argument, we were motivated by something called the oncogene hypothesis, for which the word oncogene essentially was invented from um, Bob Hubner and George Todaro at NIH. And they had speculated in the PNAS at a time when it would publish wild stuff, <laughs> uh, which I miss. Um, <clears throat> they, had, they, they had suggested that cancer arose from the activation of oncogenes in cells that had been dropped there by tumor viruses in the distant past, mm. and that what chemical carcinogens is to turn these on. Now, the proposal ignored the question of uh, how come all these different species 
get cancer. I mean, you know, when was this thing dropped in? <laughs> how many times <laughs> had it been dropped in different species yeah. or how early in evolution had it been dropped? I mean, that was the basic idea. And we thought, okay, here we've got a probe for an oncogene at mm -hmm. least. Let's see if it's in normal cells. That, that was the other driver for doing the experiment. Well, it was, but of course, as it played out, it f turned the idea upside down. A, a normal cellular gene had been become an oncogene uh, in the virus. And it took some time to prove that uh, point. But meanwhile, Dominique did the necessary experiments to show that the DNA was, uh, the, the, um, that something related to SARC, intimately so, uh, based on the criteria, the, the stringency with which we did the molecular mm -hmm. hybridizations, must be very closely related to the viral SARC, was in normal chicken DNA, and then we went back, uh, coached by uh, Alan Wilson from UC Berkeley, we went back through the phylogeny of birds, all the way back to the ratites, the most primitive mm -hmm. birds still around. It was in all of those. Uh, so there was this in conserved uh, nor a gene in normal cells, that was related to the viral oncogene. Okay. Um, it wouldn't have taken two years now, but it took two years then before we published it. <laughs> uh, we also could find RNA uh, uh, related to, to this gene, but only uh, after um, we had been prompted by a question from one of our research associates, uh, uh, pointing out that we didn't have a control in one of the experiments we were doing. And so, well, we'll use um, uh, mouse RNA as a control because we can't find this in, we mm -hmm. haven't been able to find it in mammalian DNA. Uh, well, we did that experiment and oops, it was in mammalian RNA. And we realized <laughs> then that we just hadn't dropped the stringency of the hybridization mm -hmm. far enough to be able to, to get into, uh, into mammals. It, right. it was good enough to drop the stringency to pick up. We had dropped it far enough to pick it up the ratites. Uh, and actually, it was the, the data were elegant. I mean, the, 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 uh, I mean you, you could just track the phylogeny with the, the, uh, the, the denaturation curves of the hybrids right. that you formed. You know, uh, and and the, uh, you could just track the phylogeny as, as the, the greater the divergence from chick. Uh, our probe, of course, was essentially chick. Right. gene in, in a chicken virus, uh, the lower the stringency had to be to, to permit the hybridization. And uh, it was just a beautiful little illustration of evolutionary divergence. And, but the, the, clearly the gene was conserved. And uh, so yes, it was in mammals and it was in humans. And we found the RNA, we found the protein. It was a dead ringer for the viral protein. It eventually became clear, uh, not from our work actually, that um, what had happened was that the normal gene had been, been mutated uh, and that created a constitutive activity of the kinase. Uh, uh, the mutation occurred either uh, during the, the uh, transfer of the gene from the normal genome into the virus. We think we understand how that happened. It's a pretty Baroque story. Or alternatively, uh, during the, uh, when Rouse first isolated this uh, virus, he, he picked it up only after he had uh, been transplanting uh, a chicken sarcoma from one chicken to another for quite mm -hmm. some time. Uh, and so it might have occurred, the transduction and the mutation mm -hmm. might have occurred mm -hmm. during that. Uh, uh, in any event, uh, uh, here, what, the, here was a perfect paradigm for what's going on in cancer. A normal gene mutated becomes uh, an oncogene. And actually, Hidesabura Hanafusa repeated that transduction eventually. He actually showed it, he actually made it happen in the lab. It was quite uh, remarkable. So, Michael, of everything that you've done in science, you've done a lot besides what we've talked about today, what would you pick as the item that has had the most impact on the field? Uh, well, I'd have to pick the co discovery of the kinase. Uh, with Ray Erickson's lab, and it truly was a co-discovery, although Ray published uh, a little bef a bit before we did. Um, and, um, and he deserves credit because it was his lab that, uh, Jane, uh, uh, Joan Brugge and his lab who mm -hmm. developed the antibody that made it possible to see the viral, the, the SARC gene product in the first place. Um, 
So obviously that had huge significance that was just greater, just amplified all the more by the discovery by Tony Hunter that mm-hmm. this kinase and Owen Witte, uh, that the Abelson kinase, uh, phosphorylic tyrosine, which was unheard of at the time. So that, that, that obviously okay. huge ramification. But the one that I like mm-hmm. because of the medic in me is our discovery uh, that a gene related to the MIC proto-onca gene, which was the sec, uh, we went on after SARC, we wanted to see whether this was true of others, and we went on and looked at something called the myelocytomatosis virus mm-hmm. of chickens, which I wanted, I was studying because it caused renal carcinomas as well as uh, 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 hematopoietic tumors, and there weren't a lot of uh, retroviruses around that caused solid tumors. Uh, so we, we used the tricks of the trade to show that, yes, um, there was a normal gene counterpart to the oncogene, which was called MIC for the myelocytomatosis. Uh, and uh, two of my postdocs, Carrie Alitalo and Manfred Schwab, had this, uh, we had reached a point where we really wanted to know whether these things had something to do with human cancer. Mm-hmm. And at about the time that uh, Weinberg and others showed that there was mutant RAS in uh, some human cancer cell lines, uh, and that, uh, and several labs had shown that uh, chromosomal translocations had activated MIC, my gene, <laughs> I like to think of it, um, uh, in uh, Burkitt's lymphoma and other B cell tumors. Um, we were looking at gene amplification. Um, I had had a student work in my lab for a while from Bob Shimke's lab, and Bob had put gene amplification on the map by his discovery that that's how certain forms of drug resistance arise. So we were looking at neuroblastoma cell lines, which were um, known uh, to have um, uh, <clears throat> double minute chromosomes and homogeneously staining regions, which are cytogenetic evidence of gene amplification. And we had about five or six proto-oncogene probes in hand at that point, and they decided they would just do a fishing expedition. Uh, they would just at this point, we had all learned how to do Southerns, which we didn't even have that when I started. Uh, um, and <clears throat> they screened Southern blots uh, of uh, these neuroblastoma, the DNA from these neuroblastoma mm-hmm. cell lines, mm-hmm. and over half of them lit up with the MIC probe, except it wasn't the restriction pattern of MIC, the restriction enzyme pattern of MIC. It was another gene related to MIC, which was eventually, first we call it NMIC, and eventually it officially became MIC N. Uh, so here was this known proto-oncogene, grossly amplified hundreds of times in many of the, but not all of the cell lines, and pr- overproducing uh, its RNA and protein. And so we got our hands on tumors from uh, fresh tumors and uh, discovered that there was amplification in some of the tumors and not all of them. and it was immediately apparent that the amplification was in the, t- the tumors of the worst stages, the mm-hmm. three, stages mm-hmm. three and f- um, four, which were mo- the most aggressive forms of the tumor. And at this point, um, we sort of uh, handed this over. Uh, we were still co-authors in the first paper, but we handed it over to a consortium, a nationwide consortium uh, that studies neuroblastoma. And they did a large study uh, uh, to show that, yes, there was this strong correlation between amplification of NMIC and the grade of the tumor. And that eventually parlayed into stunning data uh, that uh, made amplification of MIC as one of the most powerful biomarkers in oncology. And it persists to this day. Um, it absolutely predicts whether a child is going to respond or not to the, stand, the, conver- the, the current therapies. Uh, it was the very first biomarker to come out of the study of proto-oncogenes. It was really the first biomarker to come out of, quote, genomics, primitive though they were then. And um, it is still, it's still one of the principal um, laboratory measures for how to manage uh, children with neoblastoma. Uh, um, and um, that, uh, I like that. Your pathology mentor from Mass General would be proud of that. Yeah, right? unfortunately, he 
predeceased the, <laughs> the discovery. I have one more question for you. Yeah. If you hadn't become a scientist, what would you have done? Um, well, there are two answers to that question. What would I like to have done? Be a professional musician. That was out of the <laughs> question. So I, I had thought that through. I thought if I failed in, in, in my postdoctoral training at NIH, if that didn't work out, uh, I had an invitation to come back to the Mass General and uh, uh, not only be a resident there, but be chief resident, actually. And I figured I would just having developed an interest in viruses and having enjoyed caring for people with infectious diseases because they were that was one of the few diseases we could do anything about at the time I was a resident. <laughs> that and digitalis, antibiotics and digitalis mm -hmm. were close to it. It's not entirely fair. We had corticosteroids. Um, I thought I'd go back and be a, an infectious disease specialist. Mm -hmm. That would have been my, my default, okay. my, my uh, fallback position. Never happened. I've been speaking with Professor Michael Bishop of the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. Thank you, Michael, for talking today. My pleasure. Thank you.